This morning we're going to be Sunday school. We're going to be talking about touched. Um, there are many things that will touch your heart and send a range of emotions in your life. Um, strolling down <coughs> sandy beach with the love of your life, watching the sunset, that can touch your heart and send emotions. Running through you, uh, the loss of a loved one can touch your heart and send grief and sadness. Uh, being able sometimes just to find that peace and quiet will touch your heart. Giving you a sense of relaxation and comfort. Receiving a call from an old friend will touch your heart. Sending joyful memories through you. Just seeing children suffering from, from things that they don't need, that you don't think they need to suffer from. Children suffering from cancer, things like that will touch your heart. Also <coughs> move you with compassion. Many things will touch you, but there is nothing like being touched by God. Glory. That's why the songwriter writer said it like this, shackled by a heavy burden, neath a load of guilt and shame, then the hand of Jesus touched me and now I'm no longer the same. He touched me. Oh, he touched me. Oh, the joy that floods my soul. Something happened and now I know he touched me and made me whole. The touch of God will not only send different emotions through you, but it will ultimately change you. 1 Samuel 10 and 26 says, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, and there went with him a band of men whose hearts God had touched. Before God appointed a king of Israel, God reminded them all of what he had done for them. Speaking through Samuel, he showed Israel how their rejection of him made no sense at all. It, may, it makes no sense to reject the one who himself saved you from all of your tribulations, all of your adversities. Why would you want to, to turn your back on the one who brought you through everything? God reminded Israel that he was still more than qualified to be their king, and their rejection of him was all because of them and not because of the Lord himself. However, God in his permissive will allowed Israel to have a king despite knowing, the, you know, how this king would treat them. They did not need a king, but wanted to be like other nations. Sometimes being like, I want to be like somebody else ain't always the best thing. God had, had led them through, uh, led them through his prophets, through judges, through priests, but they became the victim of, of trying times to be like others. Want to be like somebody else gets you in trouble sometimes. Amen. When God first chose Saul to be king, he was a good man and a humble man. He was a God, uh, God's choice, uh, not the people's choice. I'd rather God choose what he wants for my life any day than me trying to pick it and be wrong. Right. The physical description of Saul showed how he, he was exactly what the people wanted. A king that looked good to other nations because his stature was larger than, uh, than most people around him. So based upon the outward appearance of Saul, the people cheered in verse 24, saying, Long live the king. Verse 25 says, Then Samuel explained to the people the behavior of royalty and wrote it in a book and laid it up before the Lord. And Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Samuel taught them God's guidelines for both rulers and subjects. Verse 26 said, And Saul also went home to Gibeah, a valiant, and valiant men went with him whose hearts God had touched. These men that went with him were not just average men. They were not the everyday working man, but, but these were men that were advisors. They were strong in the military men. Their, their, their terminology, they, they were considered to be more like secret service, if you put it like that, or... or or someone high in administration. If you about they valued men, put them, put them as valued men, boldly, courageous, brave, stout-hearted, a valiant soldier. They were marked by or showing bravery or about heroic things that they had done. Uh, they they put forth an effort like no one else. They were worthy. They were considered worthy. They were considered excellent at what they did. They were men that were, were committed to their leader willing to stand with him and fight, protect him, 
no matter what adversity come through, no matter what, what obstacle came, that they were there to protect him. And they were committed to seeing the king's success. These valiant men experienced a divine touch that involved much more than you can imagine. You have to understand the heart in Scripture involves the whole spiritual nature, including the will, the intellect, the emotions that, that they went through. Their intellect was touched, causing them to discern their own duty and true interest of Israel. If, you don't, if you're fighting for something, your whole heart has to be in it. If you're fighting for something, then, then you have to serve that fight wholeheartedly. That's right. If you serve it with just uh, whatever's going to happen, going to happen, well, that's usually what's going to happen. Their emotions were touched. They were powerfully attracting them to, to him whom the Lord had appointed to be their captain of their inheritance True. and inspiring them to desire and confidence. Their will was touched compelling them to acknowledge the divine hand in the whole matter and their own obligation in the appointment of the Lord. If, if it's not your whole obligation to serve God, then, then what are you doing? Reinforcing with divine grace their purpose to carry out the resolution they had formed so that what, whatever, whatever they might do, they, they would adhere to the king and, and go with him to get it. Ready to protect this person, ready to serve him, ready to avenge anything that would happen, anything that was that was brought up to him, serve him in, in emergency cases that the, that it, if it would arise, they would be there for him, and and just the capacity of just being there that was required. Without this touch of God, none would ever be saved. True, there are ministries, there's programs, there's many different. There are many different streets and avenues that are used to try to attract people. You know, some big churches, they use light shows and everything. They use certain genres of music and bands and DJs. And they'll put just about anything on the platform to draw people. But these, these things without God are fruitless and, and just don't matter. Amen. They're inefficient, if you would put it like that. They're, they're, they don't work. John 6 and 4 of us said, No man come to me except for the Father which has sent me, sent me draw him, and I will raise him up the last day. It is a touch from God in the heart of mankind that draws him or her to Christ, not our acts. I can witness to somebody. I can talk to family members until I'm blue in the face, but until God pricks that heart, until God touches that person. Every, every, now, now, what I'm saying, it, it, it counts. What I'm saying, but, but sometimes you feel as if you're witnessing to somebody or you're talking to a family member and it's just like you're spitting words at a brick wall and they're falling down on the ground. Well, sometimes it may feel like that, but you just keep on witnessing to that person because only God's touch is going to, hey, what they were talking about matters. God can touch the heart of that person and click in the mind of that person and say, hey, what they've been witnessing to me this entire time makes sense now. I need to make a move. The touch of God in the heart is an awesome thing. It's awesome because the heart is so precious to us. It's, it's deep. It's intimate. It's a personal thing. When our heart is touched, we have been deeply touched. When our heart is touched, the core of our being has been touched. When God touches the hearts of mankind, it is it's with the touch of conviction that produces conversion, commitment, right. yeah. and communication. Right. Conviction, it, it, it's, that is the moment when God touches people's hearts and, and something we know with assurance that, that in Him, because it's not simply just, just your conscience talking, or it's not shame talking. This, it's not a sense of... of fear or, or punishment that you're thinking about. It's not just merely the knowledge of right and wrong, but conviction comes from the Greek word elencho, which means to convince someone of the truth, to reprove, to accuse, refute, or cross-examine. Conviction exposes evil, reproves evildoers, and convinces people that they need a Savior. 
Conviction is not something that just makes you say, oh, I'm, I'm wrong, I'm wrong. That's what most people think. But conviction, oh, I'm wrong. But no, it, it's something that, that shows you where you're lacking. And then it lets you know that you have a Savior and that you need a Savior. Right. right. Acts 9 and 1 through 6 says, Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any, any of this way, whether they were men, women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined right about him a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city. And it shall be told thee what was to do. Now, sometimes it's easier for God just go ahead and give us the answer. Lord, what you want me to do? Why won't you do this? And sometimes you ask, Lord, well, Lord, what you want me to do? Well, I want you to do something first, and then I'll give you the answer. Or I want you to do this, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, and then I'll let you have the answer. All right. But it brings forth conversion. It brings forth conversion, meaning the repentance of sin. Uh, commitment, the foundation of our relationship with God. The response on our part from the touch of God in our hearts. See, we have to have that response. God reaches down and touches you. He don't expect you to sit there like a knot on the wall. He wants that response from you. That is commitment. That is committing yourself to what God is touching you and, and letting you know. Communication. Communication is more than just our ability to talk, but it, it's also to listen to what the Lord is saying. I imagine sometimes the Lord has answers for people, and he wishes he could just tell them, hey, just shut up for a minute and let me talk. All of that, what you're doing right now, you're doing it for naught because I'm trying to tell you what I want you to do, and you're not listening. As we communicate with God, the first part of that communication is listening. God's primary ways of communication with us are through His Word. Are you digging in the Word? Are you digging in the Word? There have been times I've been going through things in my life. God, I need an answer. God, I need an answer. You're not talking. You're not talking. When I opened my Bible and read it, there was the answer I needed. Come on. Come on. Amen. Right. When God touches our hearts, it causes us to, to fulfill a certain purpose. It, 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 you may not know what that purpose is at that moment in time, but you are starting the process in fulfilling the purpose that God has for you to do. Acts 13 and 2 says, As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, from the work whereon to I have called them. Our purpose is... is even though some people think that our purpose ain't to be rich, it's not to be famous, it's not to be a doctor, a lawyer, or an athlete on TV that somebody can see anything, anything like those avenues we can use to bring our purpose to, to what it needs to be. Our purpose in Christ is to glorify God, to right. praise God, to know God, and to know Him better. I know God. There's people who say, yes, I know who God is, but do you know Him better? Better. I want to strive to. I, I know God. I've, I've been in this all my life. But do I know Him? I know there's always room for me to move up and know God better than what I know Him right now. Right. I want to know Him better. To to fellowship with God. Uh, Solomon concludes the book of Ecclesiastes as such. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God. Keep His commandments. For this is the whole duty of man, for God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good, whether it be evil. Solomon is, is, is saying that life is all about honoring God and with our thoughts, with our lives, and keeping his commandments. For one day we will stand before him in judgment. I want to know I did every single thing that I possibly could. That way when I stand before him in judgment... I hear those words I want to hear. Well done. Yeah. 
The touch of God on our hearts causes us to have, have that pure religion. Now, most people, uh, they, you tell them, oh, yeah, I have religion. And it don't mount up to nothing. I want that pure religion. And not just, just a form of godliness. I want, I want what God has for me. James 1 and 27 says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction and to keep himself unspotted from the world. Am I witnessing like I'm supposed to? Am I reaching for the ones that need help when I need to reach for? When God touches our heart, it causes us to live. You say, well, I'm living. No, but when we really get touched by God, then you, I just started living I found me a brand new life. When God touches you, you begin to live. Right. Michael 6 and 8, He hath showed thee, O man, what is good and what doth the Lord require of thee, but to, but to do justly and to, and to love mercy and to walk humbly with, with thy God. When God touches our heart, it causes us to have concern for other people. I, I, I've seen myself just looking back at the way I handled things some situations, Brother Kenneth, I was heartless. I, I, that's the only way I can put it. The way I handled that person going through what they were going through, and at that time I may have been busy or had something else on my mind, may have been going through something even myself, but the way I handled that, I was heartless. Yeah. I, I did not put the care into it that needed to be, be put into it. Romans 10 and 1 says, Brother, my heart's desire and, and prayer for God, uh, to God for Israel is that they might be saved. People need deliverance. People need saving. So when our hearts have been touched by God, we desire that all are saved. It's not just about me and my little clique, my little group. It's not about me and just Pentecostals and watching. No, it goes outside of these walls. It goes out into the streets. It goes out to every person that I meet. Every single person that I see, it goes past these four walls. That's right. yes. They need deliverance. They need to be Amen. saved. We, we should be desired that everybody we come in contact. It may be the worst person you may think to yourself. That, you, that is why God does not give us the ability to give the gift of the Holy Spirit. Because right. on human feelings, we would hold back maybe from a person that really needed the Holy Ghost and said, well, I remember what they did to me. They don't deserve the Holy Ghost. That's why it's not up to us to give the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's up to him. But we should desire that everybody be saved. We, we don't want to see anybody go to hell. Uh, we, we don't want to see anybody suffering from fear, from doubt. Understand that people need direction through the Holy Ghost and the Word of God. They need discipleship. You have to teach people. You, you have to to encourage people. There are some people that just cannot encourage themselves. They would say, I encourage myself. There are some people that just can't do that. They need encouragement. What are we here for? We talked about it in men's, men's, uh, men's meeting this morning. That, that's why that impenetrable shield of, of each man, each person in this church, when we lock the shields together, that's what being a, a unit of one, but more than one. Right. That's what we're here for, to lean against that person that we need to lean against. They, they need encouragement. You have to encourage them. Ten, ten being the number of divine order, completeness, and testimony. Ten things that touch the touch of God produces in our hearts. Number one, it is the touch of a light that illuminates. Here, here begins all true conversion. It, it is God that touches the heart with the living light of His grace. His light will illuminate things that we have never seen before. Just the touch of His light. Number two, it is the touch of an owner that claims. As a man lays his hand upon his lost or stolen property, saying, This is mine, God lays His hand upon the human heart and demands it as His own. It has been captured and kept from him, but he will not relinquish his claim. Sin may have a grip on somebody's heart, but God's hand is on that heart saying, this is mine. That touch, that is saying that this is, this is my heart. Amen. Number three, it is a touch of a weapon that wounds. The heart is in rebellion and it must be conquered. 
The two-edged sword of spirit must pierce and cleave it before it can be cleansed and cured. Sometimes God has to, has to shave away some things off that heart. Right. It, it takes some cutting away. It's painful, but it takes, it takes that in order for you to be what God wants you to be. Mm -hmm. Number four, it is the touch of a hammer that breaks the heart of his people, hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. God has graciously smitten the stone and turned it to flesh, and now he binds up the broken heart and heals the contrite spirit. God has had to break my heart sometimes. You say, well, why would God want to break your heart? He's had to break me down into the point where he, the, the, the barrier I had built up, the hardness that I had built up had to be broken down. I had to be broken down to nothing in order for him to form me back in what he wanted me to be. Right. Number five, it is the touch that dissolves. Job said in 23 and 16, God maketh my heart soft. The touch of God can melt the hardest heart and change it into a crown jewel for the king of kings. Like I said, we would look at somebody sometimes and we would say, mm, I don't think God could ever touch that man. Or I don't believe God could ever change that woman. It's God's touch that can, can melt the hardest of hearts. Right. It is God, only God's touch that can, can touch someone, someone that we would have never thought ever dreamed would walk through the church doors only God's touch can touch that and, and make them surrender. Yes. Number six, it is the touch of a key that opens because the heart is closed against him by selfishness or anything like that. Acts 16 and 14 says, And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city, which worshiped God, heard of us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. The heart is closed against him by sin and selfishness. Only God has the key that can open your heart. That, that locked place that, that you may have things hidden from your past. That locked place that, that, that you may have things put away that you don't want anyone to know about or, or you don't want anybody to see that. Only God has the key to that door that can open that, reach in there and take all that out and discard it. What you should have done a long time ago. Right. Seven, it is the touch of a spirit that quickens. Ephesians 2 and 2 says, And you have quick, he hath quickened. Who we are dead in trespass and sin, we are all dead until God touches our hearts. Our intellect is dead. Our will is dead. Our emotion is dead. And none but he who breathed into the first human for the breath of life can make man once more a living soul. Without that touch, we're dead. Without that touch from God, we're just we're just a, a dead soul. That's all we are. Number eight, it is the touch of a healer that restores. He is the only one that can heal sometimes. Doctors and, and natural doctors can give you things and do things to make you heal, but only God is the true healer. Number nine is the touch of a fountain that cleanses, a fountain that, that never stops flowing, a, a fountain that no matter how drenched in sin you are, how dirty in sin you are, it is a fountain that flows and can cleanse that. He is the cleanser. He is the fountain that flows. Number ten, it is the touch of a magnet that attracts. God is love and the heart he touches must, must gravitate towards it. It moves towards him. And when Elijah passed by Elisha plowing in the field and threw his mantle over his shoulder, he instantly left that oxen, standing in the furrow, and ran after the prophet, and he never left him again until that chariot of fire took him away. So it is the touch of God that, that draws us. It is the touch of God that makes us have that so-called spiritual magnet that no matter where God goes, what God's doing, what the church is doing, I won't be attached to it. Like the valiant men whose heart were touched by God, we will determine, we, we, we will determine to have our hearts touched by God. You can, you can shut God out. It's your decision. You want to block off God and not have anything to do with that? See, I'm determined to be a valiant man whose heart is, is touched by God. I, I, want, I want to determine in my life that I want to follow him. 
I want his hand on every oh, single yes. thing that I do in my life. Yes, yes. I don't want I don't want his hand to be off of what I'm doing. I don't want his hand to be <coughs> if his hand's not on it, then it's not the will. Right. It's not his will, then it's not gonna go right. It's not gonna turn out right. I, I want to have his touch on my life. Will you allow God to touch your heart? You have to ask yourself that question. Let me take down my barriers. Let me take down this hard on stuff. Let, let me just do away with all that and ask God to touch me. Amen. The question I want to ask you is, can you say like the song says, he touched me. God bless you this morning. Glory. Glory. Thank you, Sean.